The deeper we look into space, the farther back we see in time. Light travels 670 million miles an hour, but even at this speed, light from even the closest big galaxies takes millions of years to reach us. Looking deep is looking back, back to when the universe was younger. Right now, our best tool for viewing the young universe is the Hubble Space Telescope. This is Hubble's deepest view into space, known as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Here, astronomers have found galaxies so far away that their light began its journey to us more than 13 billion years ago. We're seeing these galaxies as they were when the universe was just 600 million years old. In human terms, this discovery is comparable to a teenager looking at a six-month-old baby. But for these galaxies, the universe was no nursery. It was more like a brutal football game. The earliest galaxies were small dwarfs, smaller even than the ones Hubble has seen. They grew by colliding and merging with other small galaxies, as shown in this simulation. Over billions of years, these mergers built up the giant galaxies we see today. Mergers triggered pulses of star formation that created the elements necessary for planets, and ultimately, life. But to see beyond Hubble, to witness the origin and development of galaxies, astronomers need a new tool. This is Hubble's successor the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now being built. Its mirror, 2.75 times the size of Hubble's, and instruments are optimized for a part of the spectrum where the most distant galaxies shine, the infrared. Hubble sees infant galaxies. The James Webb Space Telescope will see newborns. MIRI is one of the four instruments on board the James Webb Space Telescope. It's the one instrument on board the telescope that will be observing at mid-infrared wavelengths. The other instruments focus on the near-infrared part of the uh, spectrum. NERSPEC, NERCAM and the FGS, they work at wavelengths from about 1 to 4 or 5 microns. Now MIRI is unique on the James Webb because it operates at even longer wavelengths than that. So we start at 5 microns and we keep going out to 25, 30 microns. MIRI is actually a, quite a complex instrument. It has uh, several different observing modes uh, on board uh, in the instrument. So we have a, a camera uh, that just takes uh, images in lots of different filters across the mid-infrared wavelength range. We also have spectroscopic modes, so we have a low resolution spectroscopy and we also have a medium resolution uh, integral field spectrograph. When you look in, inside our own galaxy, you can see dusty regions and there's things going on inside those clouds, inside the dust, that you can't see because dust is essentially opaque. If you move out to longer wavelengths, out into the infrared, the opacity, you know, the amount of light that is absorbed by that dust drops. And so we can see not just the surface, but into the, the heart of dusty region. So that means we can see to the center of our own galaxy more easily. We can see inside dusty regions where stars are being formed and see them, you know, see, see what's really going on when a star is formed in space. We're really going to be able to address a huge range of, uh, of science questions. MIRI is going to be able to probe uh, even further back into the history of the universe. It's going to be able to really study the atmospheres of planets around other stars and really be able to kind of search for the signatures of molecules in those atmospheres. Those are some, just a few of the highest kind of profile science goals that we hope to achieve with MIRI. The James Webb Space Telescope. Here at NASA, NASM, I should say, excuse me, we have been eagerly awaiting the launch of JWST, 
the James Webb. Now scheduled for the spring of 2019. Over the past several decades, the Hubble Space Telescope and other great observatories on the ground and in space, like the Compton, Spitzer, Chandra, and the Explorer, especially the COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, have presented us with a wholly new view of the universe, but it's a glimpse. How it started, we have glimpsed, and how it might end, we have glimpsed. This new view has, of course, raised many new questions that we hope JWST will answer. It has certainly been designed to do so. So our series this year is devoted to articulating those questions and meeting the telescope that was built to answer them. Dr. John Mather is very well known to all of us here at NASA and around the world. He's been for some years senior astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and is now the project manager for the James Webb Space Telescope. Dr. Mather's research focuses on infrared astronomy and cosmology. As a postdoctoral fellow at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York in the mid-1970s, Dr. Mather led the proposal efforts to what became COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, which launched in November 1989 on a Delta 5000 launch vehicle. Dr. Mather began work then at the Goddard Space Flight Center in a project that led to COBE. As a study scientist, then he became project scientist and then principal investigator for one of the three principal instruments that is on COBE. And that, of course, another selfless uh, uh, plug, uh, we also have uh, a, uh, a model of on display in the Explorer of the Universe gallery. And uh, he's been leader of many, many science teams representing scientific interests, uh, not only to other scientists, but to project management at NASA and in industry. He served on advisory and working groups for the National Academy of Sciences, for NASA, and for the National Science Foundation. And very notably, has been very active fostering future generations of scientists through his efforts for the National Academy of Future Scientists and Technologists. In 1991, Dr. Mather was presented with the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum trophy, our highest honor. He shared the trophy for current achievement with the Kobe team. In 2006, he, because of that prize that we gave him, of course, received the Nobel Prize <laughs> for physics, along with Dr. George Smoot of the University of California at Berkeley. The prize recognized the recipient's discovery of the thermal nature of and the irregularities in the cosmic background radiation. This is the first time it became a thing that you could imagine. That is using COBE, Dr. Mather and Dr. Smoot discovered, and I quote, the basic form of the cosmic microwave background radiation as well as its small variations. Work that confirmed the bang, Big Bang and articulated early remnants of its structure and character. In 2007, these are the times when he has been here gracing uh, this stage, Dr. Mather generously donated a replica of his Nobel Prize to the museum. The Nobel Foundation, you may know, mints uh, three medals for each laureate. Dr. Mather gave us one, gave NASA one, and he kept the gold one. Even so, it's my distinct honor and total pleasure to introduce Dr. John C. Mather. Well, 
Well, my golly, after that introduction, I say, what a layabout that guy is. <laughs> but it proves the, um, there was one small correction I need to make to David's story, which is I'm not a project manager, I'm a scientist. And the scientists uh, are very appreciative for the project managers because they have a skill that I don't have. Now, they can make things happen with huge teams. So uh, what I have to show you and what I have uh, that we've learned with the COBE satellite, it was all because of managers and engineering teams and technicians that took ideas and made them real. So building something that was never built before to discover what was never known before. So today uh, we are riding on a, an immense wave of discovery. Incredibly powerful human society that we're part of is now able to do practically anything at once. It takes a little while, but we get there. We are putting in huge efforts in every area of science and engineering. We are really only held back by our imagination and the laws of nature. If you can imagine it, you can build it. Almost. <laughs> if it's not impossible, somebody will try it. We might as well be the ones. Uh, so thanks for coming to participate in the story I have to tell you about this grand vision. Uh, in 1954, I was eight years old, and Mars was very close. Uh, we saw the planetarium show at the Puseum in New York City, the Hayden Planetarium, uh, before this one this, that we're in today uh, existed. My dad bought a telescope from Sears Roebuck. It was about that big around, a little bit bigger than what Galileo had, and it wasn't nearly enough. And I've been waiting all my life for a better one. And I think we are still waiting for even better ones. We are getting them. So um, we used to know that the great Talamar telescope was the biggest one we would ever have, because you couldn't make a bigger piece of glass. And it wasn't worth it anyway, because the atmosphere is too jumpy and make us shimmering uh, distorted images. So those have been beaten. We know how to beat that. So um, and it was all in, uh, in those days, it was before the space age, it was, but it was during the Cold War when children like me were taught to hide from a nuclear bomb by getting under the school desk. Even a kid could tell that wasn't going to work. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the space age short, shortly after that started, uh, spy satellites were built. Uh, President Kennedy uh, said that we were going to the moon, not because it was easy, but, but because it was hard and uh, that we would do that and the other things. He promised we would do many, many things, and not just that one. Um, and this was before um, the information came with billions of customers supporting millions of engineers to build whatever you want. So uh, we're still riding that wave, and we're nowhere near the end of it. Um, so we're not quite yet to the galactic civilization, but. That was something else that was on my mind when I was 13 in the library. I was reading Isaac Asimov's uh, Foundation Trilogy. He talked about the great galactic civilization and the need for uh, scientists and mathematicians to find a solution that would enable a hidden foundation to preserve civilization after the great galactic civilization would crash because it was corrupt. So we still have a problem, uh, and scientists and engineers are called upon to to uh, help us out through ever, through uh, history. So Bill Gates says engineering is going to be the solution to a lot of our problems. I think he's right. I think we are not going to run out of the need of science and engineering any time in our future history. And I think that future history is going to be very long indeed. So today I'll only show you a small slice of that vision, a small piece of the great James Webb Space Telescope that you see on the screen behind me. Uh, it is named for the man who went to President Kennedy with a plan for the Apollo program. And he got there, uh, made it happen. Uh, just eight years after the speech announcing it was done, we sent people and they put their feet on the surface of the moon. Can you imagine that? So we proved we can do things uh, we, when we have the support of the people and the right mindset. We did, and we still do. So now I want to show you the telescope itself, uh, talk about why it's important scientifically, a little bit about the engineering behind it, and just a hint of the science that we're going to hope to do with it 
Uh, the future lectures in this series will tell you much more about that. So at any rate, here's the picture of the observatory on the screen. I don't know if my pointer will go there. Do you see a pointer up there? Yay! I've got a pointer instead of a laser pointer. Um, anyway, what you see in the middle is this gigantic mirror. It's uh, 20, six and a half meters across. Okay, if I use metric units tonight? Uh, for, for those of us in the English units, it's 21 feet. It's uh, bigger than what you see there on the screen. Anyway, it is protected by a big umbrella, a sun shield, we call it, which is as big as a tennis court. And it is a joint project of uh, NASA along with European and Canadian space agencies. It's an enormous project. It's the most difficult one we've tried at NASA in science and engineering uh, for science. It's clearly not as difficult as the Apollo program. Um, but all the same, it's just very appropriate that we should be naming it after James Webb, the man. So to start with uh, some of the big questions that are in front of us, uh, some of the people asked these things before we got started here. Um, how did we get here? So we know quantum mechanics, uh, has, we've known about it for since 1925 or so. We know that it governs the properties of everything. But if you want to know how anything complicated works, you cannot solve the equations. You have to go build it and measure it. Um, we know the universe started expanding, uh, that it was very smooth and very hot when it was young. We know that it's unstable in a whole host of different ways and that energy can be released from reorganizing material into different shapes. So its uh, complexity can build naturally. People didn't appreciate that, but it, it's a natural thing for complexity to grow here. The universe is probably infinite. I can't prove that to you. It is very old. It's about 13.8 billion years old, which means that there's been plenty of time and plenty of chances for the university to do things that are very improbable such as perhaps ourselves. Um, there are not very many places like ours, so we might be the only ones, uh, maybe not. But at any rate, each of us is quite unique. Uh, we know about stored information. Uh, we know how that works a little bit. <coughs> we have evolution based on the stored information in our DNA. And when mistakes are made in the copying and the sorting, uh, we get uh, individuality. We get to blame our parents for all our troubles. And um, we also can say we have probably evolved, uh, which I mark here as survival of the lucky. <clears throat> because a long time ago when Darwin talked about evolution, people said, well, survival of the fittest. <clears throat> and since we're here, we concluded that we were the fittest. So that's not very good logic. Uh, we have evidence from the geneticists that uh, perhaps our ancestral population very nearly perished, that they were down to a few hundred individuals. So we're here because those people were lucky. Uh, and, and we nevertheless claim credit. <clears throat> we have learned about, uh, in engineering, feedback loops, and we are still trying to understand how that works. Uh, just an example, I'm standing here and you still think I'm the same person, even though almost all of my atoms have been replaced numerous times except for my teeth and the chromosomes in my nerves. So the rest of it has been changed out and you still think I'm me. So there's a lot of mysteries besides astronomy to think about and I just wanted to tell you there's a little bit more science to go. So astronomers look back in time. I guess everybody knows this one. I just like to draw this picture because it's my own hand-drawn picture. And so it shows you that you can look back in time by looking at things that are far away and we know the speed of light is one uh, light year per year, by definition. <laughs> so we know how far, we're, how far back in time we're looking if we know how far away we're looking. So we survey the universe, we draw triangles, um, we, just like you were supposed to learn in high school. Um, it's not that hard. If you know t two angles and one side of a triangle, you can calculate the whole, side, whole shape of the triangle. So that's surveying. Uh, the other method that we use is if uh, we can't use the surveying method, we say, well, I'll look at those uh, stars out there, and if I can convince you that those two candles that I drew in the picture are identical, and one of them just looks fainter, we say it's because it's further away, and we can get the relative distances. So that's worked pretty well. It's hard work, but it's standard practice. <laughs> the other thing we need to do is how fast are things moving toward us or away from us, and we use the color of light to measure this. 
<coughs> if you spread out the uh, light of the uh, fireworks displays that you see in the in uh, July the 4th, you see uh, each of those colors comes from a particular chemical element. Uh, we can see them in the light of the sun, um, either as dark marks across the, the rainbow, uh, if we make a good optical instrument, or sometimes they actually shine out. In a way, from this method, we can find out what's in the sun, how hot the sun is, how it moves, and in particular, we can tell if an object is coming toward us away or away from us, if the pattern of all those wavelengths is systematically shifted to longer or shorter wavelengths. <coughs> so this is called the Doppler shift. We've known about it since the 19th century. So after a lot of preliminaries, Edwin Hubble became the first person to draw us a graph to show this uh, effect about distant galaxies. So 1929, he measured or tabulated the accumulated information about how far away are galaxies and how fast are they going. And this is the picture he gave us. First graph to show that the distant galaxies are rushing away from us with a speed proportional to distance. Divide the distance by the speed, you get the age of the universe. Real simple. People, it's not, it's not such a great mystery. Um, but it was found out in 1929. And so we forget it was so long ago, and we now think it's a big mystery. So um, he did get the wrong answer for the age. Did, measuring that distance is actually pretty hard. Uh, and the biggest problem that he had was the standard candles that he were using uh, close by and far away were actually different kinds. So he didn't know that, but we took a long time to find that out. Now we know, and now we argue about the sh slope of that line within a percent or two. So we made a lot of progress. So um, David mentioned in the, in the introduction that we made a, a satellite to measure the Big Bang radiation. Here it is. This is called the Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite. Um, and it was made um, based on my fa failed thesis project and many other ideas. Uh, to measure the heat of the Big Bang. So we measured it. It came out right. So I'm not going to skip over the details, but we'll just be able to summarize it with a sim single chart telling you about the early universe. So we now know the un early universe was very hot and very compressed. It probably has no center, at least we've not been able to find any sign of one. And there's no si sign of an edge. Uh, you cannot see all the way to an edge uh, because we haven't had an infinite amount of time. So even if light has been traveling all through time, you can still only see 13.8 billion light years at the speed of light. So we have an, the imagination says it's an infinite universe expanding into itself. There's no other universe out there for it to go into. Um, and curiously enough, there is not a first moment. This confuses people a lot, but just imagine running the expansion movie backwards. So here we see all the galaxies are rushing apart. Imagine that they rush towards each other instead. When they start to collide and merge together, they get really hot. The uh, atoms are destroyed. They're turned into individual particles. And you keep running backwards in your imagination, and it gets hotter and hotter and denser and denser. But you never can get all the way to time zero. It's a curious thing. So you cannot actually say the universe was created. There was not a first moment in which it appeared. It has always been here. And this is just a curiosity of mathematics. Um, but a lot of people called it the instant of creation. Well, it's not really. So it's also not a big firecracker um, because, it, well, it's just the wrong picture. If you think of a fire, firecracker, you think of a little thing happening at a place and a time. And what we actually have in mind as astronomers is an infinite universe expanding into itself. So probably also there's no end, but I can't prove that to you. So that was the basic demonstration that the universe is as we claim. And we got a lot of evidence for it now. Now, what are we going to do about that? Well, uh, even before the, Hub Hubble, the great Hubble telescope was launched, we started thinking about what are we going to do next after that. So uh, one of my colleagues here, one of the future speakers in our series is Garth Illingworth sitting here in the front row. And he and a, a lot of other people had a conference, and they said, what are we going to build after Hubble? So the uh, book addressed the question of what do we not know, and why don't we know it, and could we answer it with a bigger and better telescope? Uh, of course, the answer is yes. 
Um, and they worked out a lot of the possibilities, including uh, some, of, some of them that look a lot like what we actually ended up building. Uh, more conferences were held, and uh, every 10 years, the astronomers have a uh, giant festival where we write a book about what's our top priority. In 1990, they didn't actually come out and say that they needed this new great telescope that we're building, but the committees, the subcommittees said so. So um, even in 1990, Long time ago, um, just, the, just a few months after the COBE satellite was launched, we already knew we had to plan for the future and something to come after Hubble. So here is the Hubble itself. Hubble is 27 years old, almost 28. Can you imagine that? It's going very well. Uh, it's been serviced, as you know, five times by astronauts that went up, uh, visited it, put in new equipment, uh, better equipment. This uh, Hubble concept goes so far back in time that it's hard to imagine how primitive the equipment would have been if we were stuck with the old stuff. So we were really thrilled that you could do that and uh, upgrade it so many times. 1990 was launched in April. So I guess everybody knows that we had a problem shortly after that. It was not in focus. So here is the astronauts uh, working with the Hubble telescope. And here's a picture of a galaxy we took shortly after the launch. Bummer. <laughs> NASA had a lot of jokes thrown at us. But uh, we said, and Congress said, please fix it. And we did. So this was brilliant and wonderful and immediately told us the universe is different from what we thought. So a committee was formed as soon as we had this to work on, and they said, what are we going to do next now? And they wrote a beautiful little book called HST, that's Hubble Space Telescope and Beyond, and they wrote an extraordinarily poetic little book that said, please build us a telescope that does infrared astronomy and make it bigger than before, if you could. So um, it still gives me chills to read that book because it's so well done. Committees don't always write good books, this one was. So here they are. Here is uh, Alan Dressler, the chairman of that committee. And there's Dan Golden next to him. Um, they met. Uh, Dan Golden heard what he had to say. Uh, and within a few months, they, at the meeting of the Astronomical Society, Dan Golden gave a, a, a plenary talk. And he said, I see Alan Dressler here. All he wants is a four meter optic that goes from a half a micron to 20 microns. And I said to him, why do you ask for such a modest thing? Why not go after six or seven meters? And he got a standing ovation. So I figured that was our first peer review, uh, and it worked. Immediately after that, astronomers and engineers from everywhere wanted to work on this new project, and so we started. So. Um, We've had grand, grand ambitions, and we are about to get there. So many, many more reports were written. So what was in that little book? Um, many mysteries that could become discoveries. Uh, what happened after the Big Bang? How did the first stars and the first black holes and the first galaxies grow? And wh what else could there be out there? Uh, how did the galaxies grow? Did the black holes start first and make the galaxies, or did the galaxies make the black holes? How do the supernovae and other exploding things affect everything? What's this dark matter and dark energy about? We were just beginning to understand about it. In fact, and dark energy had only been guessed at. It wasn't really known yet in 1995. How do the stars form, and what happens when they get old? They blow up, some of them, not everyone. The sun is not going to blow up, by the way but it will change. Exoplanets we just didn't know much about. We were just getting on to uh, that. There were a few of them out there. Now we know that there's zillions, and that's a technical number. <laughs> so pretty soon we were able to take a very long exposure with the Hubble Space Telescope called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, uh, and this picture shows a surprise. This is a picture of a place where there's like one star in this picture and all the rest of those little dots are galaxies. And uh, it's spectacular because it was a surprise. We knew before we flew the Hubble telescope that uh, galaxies could not grow very quickly. They must have, we must be able to see them growing with the Hubble telescope. By looking far enough out in space and far enough back in time, we could be able to tell how that worked. 
Well, the picture here shows us, yeah, that's not true. Um, there are a lot of little red specks on there that say, um, guess what? The first galaxies were too red to even get into the Hubble wavelength range. And they were too faint for Hubble, even if it could cover it. So uh, please, NASA, please build us a bigger telescope that can pick up the infrared light. A few years later, um, we got to discover uh, this effect. This effect is that the galaxies uh, that are supposed to be pulling each other together because of their mutual gravity, they're actually flying apart faster and faster all the time. This is now what we call the dark energy. Uh, the people who found this out got their Nobel Prize in 2011 uh, because it was such an enormous surprise. They did it with that standard candle method, by the way. They said those little supernovae out there are 20% fainter than they should have been, so something's up. It was a little hard to convince people that they were right, but they were right. And now we have lots of confirming evidence. So now I've got a movie to show you, which is, is from my perspective, the most beautiful movie I have ever seen. And uh, now we need the lights down, because I'm going to show you a really, uh, um, I'm going to show you how the galaxies may have grown from the uh, very first moments. So can we get the lights all the way off? Mm, maybe not yet. And maybe they didn't hear. I need to show you the movie anyway. So here's the movie. It shows the effect of gravity pulling cosmic material back together. Uh, so the gravity acting on the little inhomogeneity is the little seeds in the Big Bang material. It's able to stop the expansion. So the computer scientists have simulated this in a box of universe that they're rotating in front of your eyes so you can see the structure growing. And um, within a billion years uh, of the whatever started it going, the structure has already appeared. Galaxies are forming. They are forming in huge strings of material. Uh, they are stretched out in a very non-random fashion. Uh, these huge strings are actually coming together in sheets. Once in a while, the uh, computer has lined up the line of sight so that it looks like everything else all in one plane, like, like right there. So who'd have thought that? Astronomers were stunned when they found this is actually what we see in the sky as well. So this movie shows something you could never observe because it shows the time dependence. And, uh, and we're not going to be able to wait for billions of years to see if this picture is correct. Uh, but what we can do is take pictures with the Hubble and with the James Webb Telescope and see if the uh, pictures match up with what this movie predicts. This is not the most current movie, but it is uh, the most beautiful one that I've seen. So here the movie is showing the universe has gotten to be about seven billion years. When the universe is nine billion years old, that's when a lot of these explosions that you see start to slow down. And that's a good thing because that's also when the solar system is being born. And it would be really hard to start a solar system next to an explosion like that. So this about this point in the movie, that's when our solar system turns up and the great explosions slow down. Those explosions are coming from black holes and from exploding stars. So is this movie true? Got to take a picture, got to take a lot of pictures, and reason, reason through the evidence. And eventually we'll be able to tell you what's the matter with this movie and does it turn out right in the end. But it's pretty darn good. By the way, it took modern technology to even be able to make the movie. Because I think what we have coming here next is the list of people who made it. And they needed millions and millions of CPU hours and the best computers you can possibly find. So we couldn't have done that uh, a few years back. In fact, why do we need big computers like that? Well, other government agencies need them, uh, and so do you. So anyway, what else have we seen? Here's a beautiful picture taken with the Hubble. It shows a nearby uh, galaxy called the Whirlpool Nebula. And in the lower right corner, I've got a picture that was drawn by Lord Ross in 1845. 
He had the biggest telescope in the world in that year, and it was made with a big metal mirror about six feet across, sorry, two meters. And, um, and he saw the same features that we see today, uh, and he was a remarkably successful at that. Here's another beautiful picture from Hubble. This is uh, taken uh, not, not only with the Hubble, but also the Chandra Observatory. This is the exploded star called the Crab Nebula. We now know that it blew up on July the 4th of A.D. 1054. So that's part of the story of where our atoms come from. Uh, a lot of uh, the chemical elements of life were produced in that star that blew up and released for recycling. So you all are recycled from this stuff. It's all right. We're breathing dinosaur breath, too. So now we get to the telescope of my great joy. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. As I mentioned, it is named after James Webb the man. Not the current politician, but James Webb who went to Jack Kennedy with the plan. So it is a project, uh, a joint project of NASA with the European uh, Space Agency and, and the uh, Canadian Space Agency. There is the big mirror in the middle. Uh, it's uh, huge, and it's going, it is so huge that it has to be folded up for launch. The will, telescope will be cooled down to about 45 degrees above absolute zero, so that it doesn't emit very much infrared light. And we are planning to put it up in 2019 on top of a European rocket called the Ariane 5. Here's a little bit about the telescope design. Uh, for you telescope builders, it starts off with a Cassegrain telescope, but improved by having a third mirror that you can't see in the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is a telescope made out of 18 uh, pieces. The big primary mirror has 18 segments, all made out of beryllium, cold, coated with gold, and polished uh, to the basic perfection that they need when they will be cold at the operating temperature in space. Mirrors are about two millimeters thick, and getting to be perfect at the cold temperature is a huge challenge. In fact, when we said we were going to do that, people laughed at me for many years, um, but we did it. We have a package of four different kinds of instrumentation inside cameras and spectrometers. So we're going to take pictures of pieces of sky, and we're going to stretch out the light of different objects into the colors so we can analyze what's inside and how they're moving. So this is for the technical folks. It's, uh, it covers all the wavelengths from 0.6 microns, which you can see is more or less the color of a red laser beam, uh, out to 28 microns wavelength, which you certainly cannot, but your friendly rattlesnake would be able to pick it up if it were bright. So uh, very powerful. So whatever astronomy that you would like to do, um, you think about using this equipment, we can probably do it for you if it covers that wavelength range. By the way, the astronomers in our world are now writing proposals to how to use this telescope, and they're due in April. So uh, pretty soon we'll be able to tell you the basic plan of everything we're going to do, or most of the things we're going to do in the first year of operations. So now I want to show you roughly what happens to the telescope hardware. So here's the roadmap to get the telescope up. Um, we start by putting the telescope together in our clean room out at Goddard. A few of you may have seen it in our clean room. Uh, then we uh, shook it and tried to see how close it was to breaking uh, before we launch it, and it passed all that. And this little picture shows you the telescope in a, in a clean tent on top of a vibrator, a gigantic vibrator, um, to shake it and see that it will pass the test. Uh, we put it in a giant mailbox sent it around the Beltway to the Andrews Air Force Base, put it in, in its, the, the telescope in its truck, with its truck, into the giant C-5C aircraft, flew it to Houston, unloaded it there, put it into the vacuum tank there. I'll show you more. We put it back in the airplane, and we had just flown it out to California, to where the Northrop Grumman Company has their facilities. And it is about to go through the next stage, where we merge it with the warm part <clears throat> and we continue testing it, make sure it unfolds and folds up again. Then we put it in a slightly expanded version of the mailbox, put it on a, on a boat, send it through the Panama Canal, send it to French Guiana in South America, put it on the rocket, push the button, goes up into space, 
goes way out there, about 1.5 million kilometers. English units, a million miles. Uh, and it unfolds out there and does its work. So that's its trajectory. And it's uh, not quite all the way there, but about a year and a half of work left. So ah, here is a, uh, a movie uh, taken of the telescope in its clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center. It shows the robot uh, putting the telescope mirrors on. Here we have the telescope in its uh, plastic tent. We have put it on top of the, the shaker so to see if it will survive launch. Here we're putting it into the mailbox, shipping container, pushing it out through the door, and getting it ready to go into the vacuum tank in Texas. And that's the door of the vacuum tank in Texas. Here's the, the uh, truck driving down the highway very slowly. There it is. You can see it's a snug fit in the, in the uh, aircraft. <coughs> There's about an inch clearance around the mailbox inside the airplane. Landing in Houston, the truck drives out. Here it comes. Have to move the uh, traffic lights in a few places to get under them. This just gives you a little hint of the civil engineering that it takes to move something this massive and this important around the world. So there's the door of the big vacuum tank in Texas, which, by the way, was originally built for the Apollo program. That's where the astronauts practiced walking down their ladder onto the surface of the moon. So in that tank, we have put our telescope, and we tested it there. We focused it, made sure the mirrors would move, uh, made sure that we would not encounter the Hubble focus problem. Uh, so we tested it end to end, shine light all the way from the beginning to the end of the telescope. Uh, it spent three months in there, and it came out, and we were happy. It's a very good telescope. So then we take it out. There's the door. And it comes out onto a very short railroad track. And we will put it back on the airplane. There's the railroad track. I think that's that one, that movie. There it is, looking big and beautiful. Gold. Why gold? By the way, it's because it's the best in reflector for infrared light. Why is the mirror material underneath beryllium? Because it's the lightest and the stiffest, and it keeps its shape when it's cold. So now we have shipped it out to California, and it is going to meet up with this part, in which we have completed almost at the uh, Northrop facility. Here is a year and a quarter's worth of hard work convinced into a few minutes in their gigantic clean room. Bring in the parts. Here's the big clean room. Lots and lots of people are just beginning to put together the spacecraft bus, which is the framework that holds up all the avionics, the transmitters, the receivers, the computers, power supplies, uh, rocket fuel tanks, all those things in the middle. You can see it takes a lot of people a long time to do this. So when I talk about the engineering miracles that it takes to enable scientific discoveries, uh, it's not just engineering, it's a lot of people with their hands on the hardware for a long time. Here you see that we're beginning to assemble the uh, framework that holds up the sun shield, and that was a uh, simulation that they just put on the top of the telescope framework itself. You see people up on these uh, very high uh, lifting devices looking down and, and assembling things. This is an extraordinary process. 
You see people are strapped to their diving boards so they can't fall off and they can't drop any tools. Here we are preparing to put together the sun shield, which is five layers of very thin plastic covered with a metallic coating so that it can reflect the heat of the sun away. I say, golly gee, isn't this pretty hard? And the answer is yes, it is. As far as we know, there's no other way to get the science that we're after. So it makes you tired just to look at it. Uh, and our people have been there working six or seven days a week for a long time to make this happen. Here you see some of the sunshield layers have been lifted up so we can get at them. They have to be very carefully folded up. And of course we have to make sure that they unfold properly. Uh, you can't really test it in zero gravity in a vacuum. So what you have to do is pretend as well as you can here on the ground with things that hold up the weight of the equipment, uh, so you can tell. So this is um, an example of what it takes to build a really big telescope in space. Lots of people, lots of hardware, lots of equipment that you never thought you would need to be able to get at it support equipment. So after we finish all of this, we will then take this hardware and put it on a shaker, make sure that it survives the launch. We'll put it in a vacuum tank and uh, make sure that it behaves itself in a vacuum. And we will rehearse more than once, folding it and unfolding it. So golly gee, that's hard. And that's why I say this is not a, a scientist's job. This is, it takes a, an enormous effort by a team, has to be well organized, and it is possible. Not easy, but it is possible. Here they're finishing putting together the sun shield with its five layers of plastic, each as big as a tennis court. Now we're going to pull on the cables and tighten up those sh uh, sheets of plastic so they have the right shape. This is what it will look like when it's in outer space. Except you won't be able to see it because this side of it is going to be in the dark. This is the thing that makes the telescope always in the dark. So that's the engineering miracle that's currently going, going on at north of Grumman. Uh, and we will come back to... Uh, what we're going to do with it. So here's where we're sending it. We're sending it a million miles, 1.5 million kilometers out in space to Lagrange Point 2, which is over here. Sun, the Earth, is a little farther than the Moon. This is definitely not the scale. Oops, didn't mean to do that, but here is the movie of the unfolding. It looks simpler than it is in the movie, and it goes quicker than it does as we actually have two weeks to make sure this movie works right. And you say, well, how do you know what you're going to do if it doesn't work right? We have multiple ways to make everything happen. We've got two of everything where it's possible, and we have sensors to tell us whether things have worked properly. So there it is, unfolding itself in outer space without human touch, but with lots of human attention. We're watching it from here with our equipment. So when we hired the company to do this, they said this was not the most complicated thing they'd ever done in space. But I think it's right up there in the top few. There it is. It's not, it still isn't in focus yet. It isn't even set up yet. Uh, we have to wait for it to cool down to the right temperature, turn on the cameras, take the pictures, and run, run everything that we have already rehearsed to get it to focus up. But 
we know it can. There it is. After a few weeks in outer space, it'll be like this. So uh, just a few little words about what we're going to do with it. The sensitivity is extraordinary. If you were a bumblebee at the distance of the moon, we'd be able to see you. And, and astronomers call it nanogenesis. It's a very small unit of brightness. Uh, we'd be able to see you both with reflected sunlight and the heat that you would emit if you were a bumblebee out there. Now, some things are a lot brighter than a bumblebee, and we'd be able to look at all the planets, including Mars and outwards. Uh, but we do have to kind of squint for Mars because it's so darn bright. So whatever you want to know about the solar system, from Mars outwards, we'll work on it. We're going to take pictures like this, only different. This is one of our most beautiful NASA pictures taken with Hubble. It's a place where stars have just been born uh, and are being born today. And golly, isn't it beautiful? And golly, you can't see inside that cloud. So wouldn't we like to see inside the cloud? So yes, you can if you use infrared light. Hubble has some infrared capabilities, so that's what you see with the Hubble and its infrared camera. You can see partway into, into the cloud, and you can also see there were a lot of stars hiding behind that beautiful cloud. So this opens up a new territory for astronomers. It's not just for cosmology. We're looking farther out into space and farther back in time, but also uh, to see uh, how are stars like the sun being born today. We will be looking at things in the outer solar system. Here's a place that's of great interest to many people, including some of our favorite congressmen, uh, Europa. It was a satellite of Jupiter that was discovered by Galileo. And this picture was taken by a mission that we called Galileo, and it shows that Europa has an ocean covered with ice. And recently we found that there's pictures of water spritzing out from this beautiful little satellite. And so people say, wouldn't this be a great place to look for life? Got an ocean, got places you don't even have to drill in. You just go land or even fly through the plume coming out of the geysers and see what's in it. You have a chance to find out if there's organic material. Um, I think it takes a little more work to see if there are bacteria, um, but this is clearly a top priority for scientists, and we're glad that some congressmen like it. We will certainly be looking farther out also. Um, we know that there's at least one very powerful way to study planets as small as Earth. Uh, when they go in front of their own star, they make the star blink a little while, and you can figure this out. Some of the starlight goes to the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope, and we can analyze that part, um, spread it out into the spectrum and the rainbow, and get the chemistry and the temperature and properties of that atmosphere. We've already practiced with some uh, planets that we've seen that are big and bright uh, enough that Hubble can do this trick, and even the small Spitzer Space Telescope can do it. So we're working on that. We are sure we are going to do, try this some more with the Webb Telescope. Uh, we will be looking for uh, things like the TRAPPIST system. You've probably heard about this one. This is a system uh, with, uh, let's see, seven planets, um, not so different from the size of Earth, and they are in orbit around a rather small star, that's about as big as our planet Jupiter. But these are all close enough to the temperature of Earth to be interesting. The three in the middle are quite possibly capable of having liquid water on the surface. So we uh, certainly don't know that they do, but obviously an interesting place to go looking. So, um, oh, come on, I didn't want to show it twice. Okay, next picture, please. Um, just a few more speculations before we wrap up. Everybody wants to know, are we alone? Uh, and the answer is, we don't know. Um, but we're going to work on it. So the big question next that we can work on is, well, how special is Earth? Uh, we know Earth is special within the solar system. It's the only one that has these special properties. It's got oceans and continents. It's got a big magnet magnetic field. It's got a big moon. It's about the right temperature. It has uh, plate tectonics to recycle the, the ocean and the, and the rock. 
It's about the right uh, distance from a nice star, though the star lasts a long time. So that's pretty interesting. So we want to compare what we have in our solar system with what's way out there. So how are we going to know about that? We need to build another telescope. I mean, how did you guess? Uh, so we have many sketches of bigger and better telescopes to follow after this one. Um, but uh, one of them, at any rate, is called the Large UV Optical Infrared Telescope. It may be two or three times as big as the Webb Telescope and uh, capable of seeing little planets as little dots orbiting their own stars, in which case you could find out a lot more. So uh, we'll wrap up here. I think we have some time for questions. Um, but I just want to say we are still um, not going to have the galactic civilization that Isaac Asimov wrote about. Um, we cannot travel to the nearest stars in person. We have not discovered uh, warp drive. Uh, I don't think there are any very good hints out there yet. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but if we make robots and the robots are interested and patient, they can go. They don't have to breathe on the way like we do. So um, we astronomers, on the other hand, we travel at the speed of light. We receive signals from far away, and instantly we know what's out there. We have to think about it. We have to interpret our fuzzy little dots, but we can find out. So I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Thanks. So what's, what's the plan for, what's the plan for uh, microphones for our, for our questions? Well, uh, I can field questions. Uh, John will repeat uh, the questions, if that's OK. Sure. Yeah. OK. So we take questions. Right here, we'll start. Um, on the James Webb telescope, the panels that you have there, you said they're plastic. Well, they seem to be a lot more fragile than anything that's on the Hubble. So what do you do about micrometeors and meteors? Ah, uh, so her, her question is about the giant sun shield, the gigantic umbrella. It's actually made of very thin plastic. It's about not much thicker than your laundry bag. So it's very, it is fragile, but it's tough. Uh, so micrometeorites will make holes in it, and we don't care. We know how many there are, we know how big the holes will be, and it doesn't matter. There will be little pits all over the mirrors, and we also don't care. They're not very many of them, and they're not very deep. So it's all right. Have, as you know, we're in overflow. And uh, I will, I'll take a few more questions, but then we will um, uh, turn it over to the overflow people to ask questions. Question there. OK, the lifespans. The Hubble's already 27 years old, almost 28, and it's not wearing out. So. Five, ten years more is quite possible. And uh, it's still doing great science, so I don't think anybody would turn it off if it's still working. Eventually, we have to do something because we can't let it fall on Moscow. <laughs> oh, and the Webb telescope, our planned life is at least ten years. Yeah. Okay, in the white. So his question is, can we go after transient events, like gravity events and supernovae? Answer is yes, um, but we're not that quick to respond. It takes You have to phone us up with your urgent request. And then we have to say, OK, we'll think about it. And then we have to make a plan, and then we have to talk to the spacecraft. So it takes a day or two to do that. So please plan your urgent activity <laughs> in advance. Okay, w one more here, and then we'll go to the planetarium. Oh, where do we put it relative to the Earth? It's a, it's a 1.5 million kilometers out farther from the sun than we are. So it moves around the sun with us all year long and stays out there. So it's overhead at midnight, one and a half million kilometers out. Okay, any questions from the planetarium?
since the space shuttle doesn't uh, go there anymore. Is this not working? I'm not sure. Okay, so the space shuttle doesn't go now. Uh, what do we do in case of servicing? We actually have no plan for servicing. Uh, there's only one thing that would be relatively easy, which is to put more gas in the gas tank. And uh, we have made a plan where we would be able to, to dock a servicing module with it, but we're not planning to do it. Uh, one more from the planetarium. Yes, uh, 1.5 million mile journey spring launch in 2019. How long before you will have this thing send it back pictures? Oh, so how long before we get pictures? It takes a total of about two weeks to get it unfolded, a total of six months to get it all set up and working. And then you should expect beautiful pictures. Okay, so we get our communications back to Earth by way of the Deep Space Network. So there's some big dishes out in the Mojave Desert uh, and some also backup ones in Australia that we use. So, big dish. Oh, so why do we build more than one kind, really? Um, um, in the Atacama Desert and other places in Chile, we have special things we could never do in space. Uh, number one, you can make them a heck of a lot bigger on the ground. And so that always wins if you can. Uh, so, but you can't do it at all wavelengths. So each different thing that you want to see shines best at a certain different wavelength. So the hotter the thing is, the shorter the wavelength you need to use. So some wavelengths come through the atmosphere of the Earth and some don't. So um, we basically, um, that's what sets what kind of telescope you need to study what. The wavelength in question which comes from the temperature of the object. Okay. Another one from here, and then we'll move to the planetarium again. What is, what are the are you going to try to adopt? Oh, for the first year? Um, I haven't actually got a favorite project yet. We have hundreds of things we're going to look at uh, that we already know. And I think my favorite one will be the one that tells me something I don't know anything about yet. <laughs> the one that is a big surprise. So you can say what you're going to look at. You can't say what you're going to see. That's the cool thing about it. Planetarium, any questions? Um, what was the, uh, the single biggest or hardest engineering challenge in making this telescope? Oh, the single biggest challenge is definitely the mirrors. Uh, those big mirrors, they are so light that you could, you could easily lift one of those 18 segments yourself. We won't let you, um, <laughs> but you could because it's the metal has been cut down to two millimeters thick. And nevertheless, it's uh, polished to the same accuracy almost as the Hubble telescope has. Wasn't there a uh, problem with uh, beryllium that it would crystallize? Ah, so beryllium is an interesting material. Uh, beryllium comes in nature as hexagonal crystals. Well, that's not good. Uh, it's not going to keep its shape when it cools down. So metallurgists have spent a fortune and a long time making beryllium into a perfect material, make powder, compress it into a vacuum in a, in a furnace, and make a block that's totally uniform. And it doesn't work when it cools down. That's amazing. In the blue. So the question is, why do we, as about the deep fields, towards the Hubble deep field where there's nothing there to look at but a one star or so. We have basically already chosen those deep fields. Um, the ones that are most useful now are the ones we already looked at because we already understand them greatly. So and now we know those are exciting places to look. So the Chandra Observatory has looked in some, the Hubble has looked in some, uh, Spitzer has looked in some tell us some deep fields and all those are really interesting. So they're all being proposed. Uh, the planetarium again. Anybody? Did you get all any 
Oh, golly, uh, if I would love to be able to put a remote occulter out there, but I can't. A remote occulter is a thing that can cast a shadow of a distant star on the telescope so that you can look for planets next to it. So we'd love to do that, but it's not feasible this time. Maybe next time. Wouldn't you like to put an observing chair there? An observing chair? No, nah, I don't really want to go there. I need to breathe. Details. Planetarium, one more question, then we'll come back here. Oh, how was the decision made to launch on an Ariane 5? It was actually a long process. Uh, the Europeans offered this as a part of their contribution to the partnership. And then it took us a long time to say, yes, that's the right answer. <laughs> question here and then there. So his question is, what's the source of power? And we use uh, solar cells for the whole thing. We have a battery that's good for about an hour um, because we fly through the shadow for a little while. And after that, it's always sunshine on, the bright, on one side, always dark on the other. Do we offer additional information about dark matter and dark energy? Yes. Um, I don't know what the surprise will be, but yes. And we will certainly look for the effects of the dark matter because it has gravity and it changes everything. And we are going to pursue the same method that was you discover the dark energy with the standard candles and all that. Uh, we can do it a lot better with a new telescope. <laughs>